Good morning, everybody. Glad to see everybody out. If you're visiting, welcome. We're glad to have you. If you're a regular, we're glad to see you. I do have a couple announcements this morning. Um, had several professions of faith by children during the Good News Clubs. We had 10 at North Washington and uh, a total of 10 at two other schools as well. So please keep all those lifted up. As well as Miss Tammy and her group for all that they're doing, reaching out to these children. And then on uh, Saturday, the upcoming Saturday, the youth will be doing bowling, uh, be at the church at 11 o'clock for pizza, and then they'll be heading out from here. Open to everyone, all right? I mean, I feel like a youth sometimes. <laughs> My wife says I act like one, so it's okay. <laughs> and uh, please keep up with any, anything else in your bulletins. A lot of good news in there. Uh, upcoming events. Uh, as it's known, the back steps have been worked on, so please be cautious around that. Corey was out there taking care of that this morning for us. And uh, front steps have been fixed. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Jody and Brian, for all y'all do, too. Uh, this morning, I will be reading Psalms 1, if you'd like to turn. All right, Psalms 1. Hey, I'll give you just a second. Hey, I'll give you a second, Derek. Go ahead. I ain't going to rush you. I love your enthusiasm, young man. Amen. Got it? Thank you, sir. Psalms 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit for each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of the judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. We'll have an offertory hymn. Uh, Father God, I come to you just thanking you for this day, Lord, just uh, allowing us to come together and worship you freely, Lord, just to continue to be with that and all those that are being persecuted for, for the same uh, freedoms we have here, Lord, and just take for granted daily. Uh, Father God, we ask you to take these tithes and offerings and uh, help them to further your word. We do lift up all the prayer concerns, Lord, the, those that were mentioned and not mentioned. And we thank you for the events and activities our church are involved in and able to to get people out and uh, spreading your word lord uh, be it brother kyle's he brings us our message and we just thank you and love you for everything you do for us we ask all this your son jesus name amen Guys, on the Valentine or the uh, bowling thing, there is a sign up sheet in the back. Please sign up to uh, let everybody know.
let's worship together this morning. shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. continue to worship now. Let's come worship our King this morning, church. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. 
generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses the one who opened up the ocean and I need you now to do the same thing I'm standing on your faithful 
whose favor rests upon the lowly. And I know with you all things are possible. And I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. God, I need you. And oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. And oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. children then you hear your children now you are the same God you are the same God you answer prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same God you are providing providing now you are the same God you are the same God you moved in power then God move in power now you are the same God you are the same God you were a healer then you are a healer now you are the same God. You are the same God. You are a Savior then. You are a Savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you. I'm standing on your faithfulness. And oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. And oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. And I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty river, come and fill me again. Let's sing that verse one more time, church on the Holy Spirit. And I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty river, come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. Come and fill me
I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. You have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life, church, let's sing it out. And all my life you have been faithful. all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. He's running after us, church, I'll sing it. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. This is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, may that be the truth that we speak today. All of our lives, you've been faithful and good, and you're running after us. No matter what we have done, no matter what we're going through, you're always with us, no matter what. You never change. You stay the same. We're so thankful for that. 
May we be with the rest of the service. May let us believe this place in your name, I pray. Amen. 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 Right. Huge round clap. Uh, praise this morning, right? For <laughs> Definitely believe the Lord is running after us. For sure, for sure, right? Um, right, I know that there is lots going on, right? And I know the Lord is at work in many ways, and I am truly grateful for you being here this morning, right? And I don't want to take that for uh, granted in any way. I truly, truly believe that God has uh, sent you here to receive uh, what he has. So I'm just praying right right off the of bat um, that you will, you will receive that, right, as uh, we're going to be uh, looking Looking today um, at something that's going to be guiding our time for the next several weeks. Uh, something that the Lord uh, began speaking to my heart before I went to um, India. And then as I was there, right, he just kind of confirmed this is the route that we really needed to go um, in many different ways, right? In many different ways. And I'll be sharing lots of those over the next several weeks, um, but just the importance of a biblically sound church, right? And how important that is that we're a part of a church that is truly biblical and in, the, in, in every sense, right? So I, I really want your minds to already begin asking, do you need this biblical church? Do you need a, a place where God's word settles every decision, every thought, every problem, every heartache, every hardship, every need that comes up in your everyday life, the Bible can answer. Do we need a church that is founded completely upon that, right? Praise the Lord. Charlie's already got it. it works for me. We really need that, right? And it's something so wonderful, even as uh, these last two weeks of, of just participating in corporate worship and seeing so many things. And I, I think back just really briefly, right, just on two weeks in India, and this time, right, there was almost absolutely no English-speaking worship, right? So our entire services, which we had multiple times every day uh, in different contexts, Every bit of it was in Tamil. Nothing in English, right? So grown men and women would come and lead us, or kids would lead us in worship, and we knew not one word that they were speaking besides Yeshua. But I can tell you my spirit knew the words. I can tell you as they sang their heart songs, songs in their native tongue, right? that God's spirit, right, just adapted every one of those. And we, we talk so much about what happened in the book of Acts, right, and what happened at Pentecost and many people speaking tongues, and we blow that completely out of proportion from a church standpoint all the time in the sense that we think by babbling some words that we're speaking in tongues, right? But what I do want you to know is that for two weeks, right, God's spirit spoke to my spirit, right, his spirit on the inside of me as we sang, and it was so beautiful. You see, we don't, we don't need these words up on the screen, right? We don't need a piano. We don't need Kevin to lead us, right? Praise the Lord, we've got him. What I'm saying is, is that God's orchestrated all of this long before these man-made things that we put into it. Our hearts have to be aligned with what God wants, right? And this morning, your voice is sounding so beautiful as you're singing. And I'm praying that as you're singing those words, that it's not just because they're on the screen. It's because you've got a personal relationship with Christ. And those words mean something. That it's what's bubbling up on the inside of you that has to come forth. And that's what we're seeing take place right now and popping up in other places besides Asbury. But what I want you to know, not to knock that in any way, guess what? Revival can happen here too. Amen. You don't have to drive an iron to will more. Let it start in your heart today. 
And please, please don't knock that, right? Because I want to encourage you. Go, go, be overwhelmed by God's Spirit. But please know, it's not contained at Wilmore, right? He is everywhere, and he's waiting for you now to jump on board and start right here. And it's what I'm praying, right? It's what a bunch of local pastors are praying, is that we don't have to load up vans of people to drive them to Wilmore, that we would start revival here in our own hearts, in our own churches, in our own community. Please allow that to take place, right? Allow that to consume you this week as you continue to dive in because I know there are so many things that shape our lives every day and we are completely blinded to it. Right? Just think about the words that you hear, that you read, that are spoken throughout your week, right? Whether you realize them or not, they are changing your thought pattern all the time. Just think about your phone, right? Come on. Think about your phone that you carry around that you cannot leave home without it, right? That if you do, you will turn around regardless of how far away you are from it. You're going back to get it now, right? Used to be our wallets. Now it's our phones. Just think about how, how glued that we are to that, especially from a social media standpoint, right? That, that everything that we look at, right, that there are algorithms that are calculating that behind the scene that will continue to show you the same thing that you clicked on one time over and over and over. Do you realize that the average person spends at a bare minimum now two hours a day on social media? That's just social media. It's not even on your phone. So what I want to do this morning, right? How many people have iPhones? All right, great, right? So if you have an iPhone, Android, I'm coming to you. It's just because I've got one, right? If you have an iPhone on every Sunday morning, what do they send you? Screen time update, right? And this is kind of something that we love to do at our home so that I can shame my kids every week to say, what's your screen time this week, right? Now, unfortunately, I pack two phones, right? Church phone and work phone, both. And uh, they try to add mine together, which is not fair, but uh, we'll talk about that at another time. Uh, but it sends you every week, right, how long you're spending on your phone. So if you don't know how to do that, Miss Ashley, show that first slide there. Uh, I hope uh, it didn't blow it up very well like I wanted to, but if you'll go into your settings on your phone, I know I'm promoting Apple today, right? If you go on your settings, there is uh, inside of there, and it will show you screen time, and it will show you your daily average. It will show you what you've spent the most time on. Apps, right? What you're looking at, exactly. So if that's not turned on, I want to encourage you. If it is turned on, I want you to spend some time today looking at how much time you spent this last week on your phone. Seeing how much of it was spent on worldly things and how much of it was spent on God. I don't need to know your time. That's between you and the Lord. If you've got an Android, right? If you have an Android phone, go to the next one there, Miss Ashley, right? Uh, you'll go under uh, settings, and then down here where it says digital well-being and parent control, you'll be able to find your digital well-being. You'll find where your dad is, how long that you've spent on your phone. Uh, it will be able to show you your screen time. So if you have a flip phone, I have no clue. I know there's some of you that still do. It's there, I'm sure. I just I didn't spend that much time. I'm looking into it, right? We're spending all of this time on our phone. Media and messaging and apps and social media, they're shaping our lives without us even realizing it and noticing it. We've all talked about those conversations that we have in our home, and next thing you know, it's the first search that pops up on your phone, right? Or as Alexa hears everything that you say, and next thing you know, she's prompting you to buy what you were just talking about that you needed. Words are shaping your life every single day, right? I want to ask you several questions today. This morning, you'll notice inside of your bulletin, by the way, I messed up. I didn't change the date this week. It's not the 12th again. Seven days have passed. It is the 19th. And one more, the family day bowling is not the 24th. It is the 25th. If you find any more mistakes, please see me, and I'll be glad to correct them. <laughs> 
What words are shaping your life? Tons of questions that I'm going to be asking you today. I hope that you'll have time to write them down. If you don't, come see me after and I'll give those back to you again. I have tons of scripture this morning and I know there are some people that are very fast at looking up in your Bible, but I want to encourage you, jot these down, look them up for yourself. I want you to grab a hold of God's word today. I want you to hear from God, not from me. My opinion means absolutely nothing. God's word means everything what words are shaping your life just just think about that let that begin to mull over on the inside of your spirit right what words do you allow top priority in your life right I usually like to insert uh, one famous book that is still being published is the gospel according to Oprah right <laughs> number one bestseller for for many many years right and people look to Oprah for answers what are the words that place top priority in your life? Is it a news anchor or a newscast? Is it a social media feed? Is it YouTube? Is it Facebook? Is it Twitter? Is it whatever? What's paying top priority in your life? I want you to realize this morning that I believe that God is stirring inside of our spirits to begin to ask these questions. Do we need a biblical church do we truly need that? Are you a part? If you're visiting here today and you're not a part of this local body, are you a part of a biblical church? If you're a part of this church, is Bethlehem a biblical church? And I don't think that we need to just pencil whoop these questions, right? I think we need to be honest. We need to be sincere. We need to begin to ask, okay, what is a biblical church? What does that look like? Not according to what Kyle Yankee says, please, 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 but according to what God's word says. We know that church membership and attendance is on the decline. And it's not just here, right? It's at every local body. And we can blame it on COVID, but that's just a lame excuse, right? There's so much more that's taking place that we don't even, we don't even want to begin to uncover because it hurts our feelings way too much when we talk about truth. I want to tell you that people are people. And most of us have been hurt some way, some shape, some fashion, some form because of church. And some people take that hurt and they check out. But I want you to know that there's always going to be pain. There's always going to be problems. And church is not going to be any different. It's still going to be a place where those things happen. And even though that it shouldn't be, even though it should be this perfect little bubble that we come into, that's not the way it is out on the world, guess what? People still bring the world inside of these walls. Problems will always be there. But I want you to know there's so much more than just these things that I've named. The enemy, he is real. Right? It's the reason why you're seeing all kinds of controversy and all kinds of words come out about what's taking place now and Asbury and several different other places, right? The enemy is real. He wants nothing more than to steal every good thing that God has given you, right? He wants to kill you not only physically but spiritually, right? He wants to destroy you. And if you don't realize that he's got a picture of you on his wall that says wanted, then you are sadly mistaken. He wants to destroy you, church. And for kids that are in the room, right, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to scare you this morning, but I want you to know there's something much scarier than the boogeyman. It is a real enemy. He's out to cause as much problems and as much chaos. And guess what? We allow that to happen all the time. I know this morning, right, that there are plenty of people here this morning and online and those that will be listening later on that are faithful members of a biblical church. And I want to applaud you in that. And I want to thank you for standing firm and doing what God's called you to do. But I, I want you to realize this morning that if we are all faithful members of a biblical church, then we will experience life to the fullest. Do you understand that God's word says that it, it, it we'll experience more abundantly, right? We'll, we'll get exactly of what God's created for us. So what is a church? 
Well, I know that we, we use that terminology, right? And I know that sometimes we give that, that, that church answer, so to speak, right? But it is a group of people who commit together to be and do all that God says a church is and does. And I wish I came up with that definition, right? But I'm not that smart. Let me, re, let me repeat that. A group of people who commit together to be and do all that God says a church is and does. So this morning, right, I want to go ahead and just issue the first challenge of this morning, right? Will you begin to commit to see if that is what you're a part of? That right now you would begin to uh, just seek God right on the inside of you to see if this is what you're being a part of, of what you're taking place. And if it already is right, if God confirms that and you're satisfied with what God tells you, then please make sure that it's not just what you think. Make sure that it lines up with what this is. This is, this is the ultimate truth, right? This is what matters the most. And if you're lacking in commitment to what this Bible says, then start checking to see what you really are committed to. See how that weighs out to what God says. And I know, I know it's so easy for us to begin to rationalize and justify our lives and how we do this and how we spend time and what we're committed to and what we're not. But I, I need you to know that none of that's going to carry any weight when you stand before Christ. Do you, do you understand that excuses won't be valid before God? You can't say, but, but wait a minute, God. If you're not a follower here this morning, and I'm using that word intentionally, right, because anybody can say they believe. And I sat across the table from hundreds of people that said they believed in God. But if you're not truly a follower of Christ this morning, this is maybe the starting point of exactly of what you need this morning in order to follow Christ, that today would be a platform that would just catapult you right into the right direction of what God is wanting to do. And I just want to pray here in this moment. God, I, I thank you for our time. I thank you for small groups this morning, Lord. I thank you for just diving deeper into your word. I thank you for time that we spent together just lifting your name and singing of your your goodness and how good that you've been to us, Lord, especially as we don't deserve it. But Lord, we're praying right now for this foundational truth of do we really need a biblical church that to mourn this morning, God, that this would be a starting point for all of our lives to continue to build upon. And I just pray I pray for every person that's here that, Lord, you would continue to reveal truths to them that would change their life forevermore. I just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to park on biblical preaching and teaching. And I know even as I say that, right, it's almost like, oh, my gosh, he's talking about something that he does, telling us how important that that is. But I, I need you to see that it's so much more than, than, than what maybe that I am expressing to you in this moment, right? That the number one thing for us to be a biblical truth has to be on what's preached and what's taught every time that we're together. Right? The Bible starts on this basis, and I want to walk you through the scripture very, very quickly, right? So that we see this in a great, great picture, right? From a 10,000 sort of feet view. But the Bible starts on these words, right? God spoke, and things were created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? Key words, God said. He spoke everything into existence by his word. We need to grab a hold of that. There was not some big bang theory, right? There was not, we just evolved in who that we are, and we could go against every other scientific sort of thing that we want to, right? God spoke 
us into existence, right? We can go over the animals and then we can go into us and then our helpers. We can see what God did with his words. But I want you to see how quickly that words were taken out of context, right? Genesis 3, 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Just look at how quickly the enemy slipped onto the scene and began to cause us to question God's word. I want you to know from this point forward, the same thing has been happening over and over and over and over and over again taking bits and pieces of God's word, his truth, and omitting them, leaving them out, setting them in a different way, causing us to question, is that really what we're supposed to do? How far can I go before it's sin? We see throughout the Bible that this sets everything into complete chaos. It sends us into turmoil, and God's people are now separated from him no longer together the way that they were supposed to be. Sin has crept in, and God's people are now cast out and gone into many different directions, and the earth begins to fill. We know all kinds of things happen. God's people get uh, locked up in slavery, so to speak, and then uh, God raises up Moses and Moses uh, leads his people out of slavery and bondage into the wilderness. Exodus chapter 24, Moses came, told the people all the words of the Lord and the rules and the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Right? And Moses just goes up, spends time with God on the mountain. He hears God's words, right? He uh, takes those down. He comes and he expresses those. And we see that as he speaks them, God's people say, we've heard them, now we'll do them. It's an overwhelming theme that constantly goes on, right? Moses continues to can't command ob obedience from God's people as they're now wandering around in the, the wilderness because of their disobedience, because they got too tired of waiting on Moses to come down. So they decide to make a golden image that they wanted to worship because God wasn't good enough. And he says, oh, now, Israel, listen to the statutes, to the rules that I'm teaching you. Do them that you may live. Go in, take possession of the land of the Lord your God, your fathers has given you. You shall not add to the word that I've commanded you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Moses is constantly saying what God is telling him, and God's people are hearing it right there, receiving those words. Deuteronomy 4, it says, See that I've taught you statutes and rules as the Lord God has commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of. Keep them and do them. Right? Over and over and over. God is speaking. He's telling. People are hearing, and they are responding, right? Right? Verse 7 in that same section, he says, For what a great nation is there that has a, excuse me, a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him. What great nation is there that his statutes and rules so righteous as this law that I set before you today. You see, it's a common pattern throughout the start of the Bible that God, God's people hear from him and they respond to it. So much to the point that I love in Deuteronomy 6, right? It says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, right? You shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you shall bind them on the sign of your hand, right? As an agreement, right? That was so much that's being said there. They shall be on the front lip between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house, on your gates. It's how much that they love God's word, that they wanted to be completely surrounded by that. They wanted it to be seen. They wanted it to be shown that they knew who God was. They heard his law, and they wanted it to cover their everyday life. But guess what? 
They get into the promised land, and it doesn't do what they were hoping for it to do. Matter of fact, they didn't do what they were supposed to do, so God didn't give them the blessing. So now they needed to hear from God, and prophets come on the scene, and from these prophets, right, one man is hearing the words from God, and he's declaring these truths over and over and over, right, for God's people. Repent, right? Hear these words. Apply them to your life. Then there's kings that come on, right? Uh, there's so much that's taking place with the kings, and we could have talked about the judges, but man, that's way too scary for most. We we know how horrific it is. Most of the kings were completely bad people. They they had such a hard time. They were away from God, but I love 2 Chronicles 34, 14. And we see it says, while they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hakiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then he answered and said uh, to Stephen the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And he gave that book to him. You see, they had gotten so far away from God's word, right, that it had just fell through the cracks. There was no copy that they were packing around, right? There, there wasn't an easy way for them to have God's word in the way that we have it now. These kings were living on their own accord, and they got power and prestige, and they didn't hear from God in the way that they should because they weren't even consulting God. But just a few verses later in verse 21, it says, Go inquire the Lord for me, for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. It's a terrible, vicious cycle for mankind. They hear from God. They apply it for a few, for a, a little while. They fall away. God passes judgment. God's word comes back to them again, and then they live back for a short time. It's just nonstop throughout all of the Old Testament, right? We see Jerusalem is destroyed. We see the temple is destroyed. And lo and behold, there are some men that come on the scenes, right? Some of these minor prophets, Nehemiah. Next thing you know, in chapter 8, it says, as they're rebuilding back the wall, it says, all the people gathered as one, um, uh, as ma uh, one man into the square before the winter gate, the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law that Moses uh, had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it from, uh, from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning to midday. That's a long service. In the presence of men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. You see, that's what's part of our DNA. There's something that's deposited on us as we're born, right, to be attentive to what God's word says. It says, and, the, and Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that he had made for that purpose, and beside him stood a bunch of men's names that we're not even going to try to pronounce. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen and they lift up their hands and they bow their heads low and they worship the Lord their God with their faces to the ground. You see, just by reading God's word, what had been missing in their lives, the reason why that they had went in the wrong direction is because they didn't know these truths and now they were being proclaimed once again and their hearts were filled with such joy and so overwhelmed that they began to just worship God immediately. You see, that's what happens at true revival. We hear God's word and we repent and we fall on our faces. We cry out. We make things right with God. And then when he touches our hearts and says, you're forgiven, get up and go, then that's when the joy comes. That's when the excitement comes. That's when we want to chase hell with a water pistol, right? That's when we want to do everything that we can to share this good news. It's exactly what happens right here as they're rebuilding the temple. All of these men, right, it says in verse 7, it says they help 
helped the people to understand the law. While the people remained in their places, they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Do you understand this is what God wants from us? It's not that he wants to give all these and these tough words that we can't understand. He, he wants you to understand this. It's the reason why that he's given it to you. He wants you to spend time. He wants you to be surrounded around people that, that maybe know a little bit more than you or maybe they don't, right? So that you can lock arms, so that you can learn from one another, so that you can grow in his kingdom. You see, two-thirds of the Bible is what we've just covered very, very quickly, right, of people responding to the Word of God throughout the Old Testament, that constant, vicious cycle, and we come to the New Testament, and John chapter 1, right, the Word becomes flesh. It's the greatest news, right? It's, it's what it should just grab a hold of us. It's what the Hindus and Muslims have the hardest time. They cannot believe that God would leave heaven and come to earth. And we know that he did. And in the beginning, there was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and it dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ It's the greatest thing that we've ever heard, right? And he's come, the word, God himself manifesting in a human form, Jesus Man, it's something so overwhelming, right? And he just didn't come to say, look at me, I'm God. No, he lived his life in such a way that we would long to model after it, that we could become like him, that we could actually be Christians. Little Christ, Christ-like. You see, Jesus came, Mark 1, and he said to them, let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that's why I came out. You see, Jesus came to do that very thing. Not his own agenda, not his own wants, not his own desires. He came to preach the word. He knew that's what changed people's lives, right? So we see this take place as we walk through the Gospels and we see Jesus' life unfold. And then the first church, right, first century church comes on in Acts chapter 2. And those who received his word were baptized, Acts 2, 41 and 42. And there were added about that day 3,000 souls. But it doesn't stop there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Do you understand how wonderful that is there? The apostles' teaching is not some new three-point sermon, not something that they downloaded from Lifeway. They were teaching the Word of God. Amen. What had been taught from thousands of years. And they were saying, hey, guess what? I know what you've been taught, all of this law. I know all of that. And every bit of it was pointing to Jesus Christ. That's what people devoted themselves to. And it goes on to say, verse four, or chapter 4, many of those who heard the word believed. number of men came to be about 5,000. Every time God's word is being preached and taught, people are coming to know the Lord. Acts 6, 7, the word, continued, or the word of God continued to increase. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Those who knew what God's Word said were actually becoming born again. How much does that need to happen in our churches today? People who have been raised up knowing this but never applying this, never making the connection from here to here. I sat across from countless men and women who would look me in the face with tears running down their face and say, I know this Jesus who you're talking about, but I'm not following him. And their hearts were breaking. They are living on nothing and dying. And yet they know that if they, if they just would trust in him, if they would apply that. You see, we've got to get back to those great truths, right? We need to know it's so much more than just hearing it. So much more than just going and running around on Asbury College. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Go. Let God's Spirit jump on you. Bring it back here if you need to. We need to hear this word. We need to apply it to our lives. 
Acts 8, right? Philip starts proclaiming. He gets born again, and he now is sharing. It says, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. How about when the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles? In Acts chapter 10, while Peter was still saying these, spirit, uh, these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. That's what I'm praying for, right? That the word of God would fall on you and his spirit would grab hold of you and you can't contain yourself. You can't control it. You have nothing but to do but to surrender your life to him. When the Gentiles heard this in Acts chapter 13, they began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord. As many were appointed to eternal life believed. Grab a hold of that. Hear that, right? People who are outside of what the, that the Old Testament talked about for so many years, Gentiles actually hearing this truth and coming to the Word of God. How about when Paul gets on the scene and starts preaching and teaching, going from town to town, teaching God's Word? That's all that he wanted to do was preach God's truth. He continued to do so, right? Not only to Jewish people, but also Greeks. Acts chapter 19, right? So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. You see, we're, we're banking on so much else doing what only the word of God can do. We're trusting in programs and designs and algorithms and all of these other church growth tools that we think are going to help us. But the, the answer is right before us. If we truly want to be what God's calling us to be and to do what God's calling us to do to get God's blessing, then we need to do what the Bible tells us. Which leads us right to the main text. What an intro. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the first four verses, right? Read this with me. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But they'll have these itchy ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Hello, is that not 2023? Is it not where we're at? Is that not what's filling our, our churches all across the globe, right? It's the number one thing as I sit and listen to 100 plus pastors in a pastor's conference in India, and most of them were asking and saying, but why is such and such this ministry is flourishing and he has all this money, he has all these things, and he's doing all this and this is growing this way, but yet I still struggle. But how come in America you have these big buildings and you have all of these nice things and you have fancy clothes and nice cars and all this, but we don't? There's all kinds of questions that begin to just unfold as we hear these truths going on all around us. This teaching of so much else that's taking place beside the Word of God. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that every ministry that is flourishing is not of God by any means, right? I'm saying that Paul is in prison and he's writing here to young Timothy to tell him to stay the course. I charge you in the presence of God, he says, right? He's saying that you need to continue to preach the word. Now, I know it's very easy for us to say, but wait a minute, he's talking to another preacher here. This really doesn't apply to me, but here's what I want you to know. You are all priests of God. You are a royal priesthood. You are all called to be ministers of the gospel. No one gets past this appointment in your life. If you're a follower of Christ, you are commanded to teach the word of God. And that doesn't have to be with words. It doesn't have to be behind the pulpit. pulpit. It has to be with your life, your actions. 
Why is Paul just, just telling Timothy, please, please, please be ready. You never know. Be ready in season, out of season to reprove, right? To rebuke, to exhort, to do all these things. And please make sure that you've got patience and teaching, right? Because there's a time coming in church. We're in this time where people don't want to hear truth. I promise you, I ask that very question every day. When someone brings a problem to me and I say, do you want to hear the truth or do you want to lie to me? And their first response will be, will the truth hurt my feelings? Because if it does, I don't want to hear it. You see, we, we, we love for people to lie to us to make us feel better. And we're allowing that to take place in church Right, that we wouldn't talk about things that God says that He's commanded for us to do, so we'll just skip over them. We don't want to look at that pa that passage, or we'll we'll say that was meant for another time, but it's meant for us. God's calling us to be holy because He's holy. He wants us to adhere to His teaching, not so that we can just feel better when we leave and say that was a great service today. Good word. I only wish so and so would have heard it that we would walk away saying, praise God, and it just landed right in my lap, and I'm going to apply what I've learned. God, please forgive me. Paul is telling Timothy to preach the truth. Why? Because these words, 2 Timothy, a verse that I hope that you would write upon your heart, and if you haven't memorized 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, then I want to encourage you, please do so, right, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be, um, may be complete, equipped for every good work. You see, that's this word. Not all of the words that you're scrolling through on here, that you're clicking on at your desktop or that you're hearing on the other end of the line or that whatever way that you're getting, there is no other book like this one. There never will be. This is the Word of God. And you listen to messages hours a day, and guess what? You don't even have a clue where they're coming from. You just need to get on your social media platform and look at how much they're tracking every day of what you're listening and watching and clicking on. I can tell you where this comes from without a shadow of a doubt. This comes from God. You can hear from him every day, all day. You need a routine doing this very thing. You need to read. You need to listen. And then you need to do what it says. I need to read. I need to listen. I need to do what it says. The Word of God should be the center of our attention. It should be what's first and foremost in everything in our life. There's nothing more important, right? There's nothing more important than the Word of God. And I'm not talking about sharing opinions and podcasts and all that stuff. I'm talking about diving into God's Word for yourself. Don't believe anything that I tell you right. Don't believe that anyone else shares in this church or teaches in this church unless they can back it up from here. And I want you to check it for yourself. I want you to bring a copy of God's Word with you. I want you to take notes. I want you to flip the pages. I want you to go home. I want you to prove what God's Word says. And if what I'm saying is not lining up with that, then you please come talk to me. You question me, and I'll be glad to sit down with you. And I am not so good to say, I messed up. I misspoke. I misquoted. I didn't get that quite right. Let's look at it together. Let's learn because that's what we're supposed to do. As iron sharpens iron, man does the same thing, right? That we're called to help one another. Please, please, please don't just come in here, listen, and just take it for at face value. Because guess what? If I can talk you into something, somebody else can talk you out of it. 
that quickly, that easy. But when God gets a hold of your heart, when his truth speaks word to you, guess what? There's nothing that can take that from you. And I'm living proof of that from 2003 when God spoke to my heart. I have never been the same and I don't ever want to be the same. I want to grow more like him. Make room in your life for the word of God above all else. I want to leave you with one last question, right, that just ties right back into where we started at. How much time are you spending on listening to the world versus on how much time you're spending listening to God? And I know, I know that's a loaded question, right, because I can, I can show you my phones, right? I can show you where my time's at. I'm not got this mastered. I've not got this figured out. I want you to know that we are held accountable for what we're listening to every day. And even more than that, right, we're, we're held accountable for how that we listen to the Word of God and how that we obey it. And if we're failing in that, then God's giving us grace and mercy right now to make it right, to do the right thing. Because one day, you and I, every person, will stand before God and you're going to be questioned on whether or not you have listened to the Word of God. So church, right, this is where I want to encourage you in this moment for us to be a biblical church. This has to be foundational. That doesn't mean that we can't have other resources and other tools and other methods to help draw us into that. But our overwhelming study guide should be this. This is what we should be listening to. This is what we should be applying to our lives. This is what should be taught. This is what should be preached. This is what we should hear. And anything outside of that is just what it is. It's just stuff. So I just I want to pray on this foundation of Bethlehem being this type of church that you and I need a church that is founded on God's word. That above all else, right, that we know that it comes from there, regardless of how much that it hurts or stings or offends us, that at the end of the day, it came from God. And that he would help us not only hear it, but he would help us apply it to our lives. So I just want to pray in this moment, God, right now, as we're, we're starting on a journey of what a biblical church looks like, Lord. And I, 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 I'm praying with so much that you are just pressing upon my own heart, Lord, with your word, that it would have ultimate place in my life. The Lord is many, many godly men that are influential in my life, many, many pastors that I look up to, many, many that I listen to weekly, many commentaries that I read, that all of those are still man-made thoughts and beliefs, Lord, and you trump them all that your word settles it. And Lord, that's what I want to ring out on the inside of my heart. That's what I want to come across my lips, Lord, and let it be said that I would promote your words above anything that I may think or I may want or the opinions that I may have because they don't mount to a hill of beans. So Lord, right now, as we're, we're, we're taking a stand here this morning, Lord, that right now we're searching our own hearts. And if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Christ, and maybe today you're hearing these truths just ring out on the inside of your ears that you need God and his word, then simply crowd exactly of where that you're at, that you realize that uh, your sin has separated you from God and without his son coming and living on this earth a perfect and sinless life dying upon the cross being buried and rose again on the third day to make a way for us to be restored back to God if you're hearing this today and you've never experienced it firsthand then know that God is offering an invitation to you to say God I need you I don't know what that looks like in my life but I know that I've made a mess I know that there's no way that I can do this without you and I'm surrendering my 
my life to you now. And please don't, don't wait till Kevin begins to play or sing. You just begin to speak inside of your heart right now. And there'll be a time for you to come down front and you can pray with someone or someone can pray with you or they can help and talk more. But don't wait. Do it now. And if you're here this morning and you know that you have allowed the world to just overfill your life in many different ways that are taking away precious time that only means something according to God. If you are being led astray by what the world is constantly just bombarding you with and you're saying, God, I need you more than I need this world, then just simply cry out. He's waiting on you. He's faithful and just to just forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, right? To just do what only he can do. And I know there are countless people that are all on different ends of that spectrum and all across it in many different ways. And there's heartbreaks and heartaches here this morning. There are things that maybe you were hoping to be addressed here this morning that you were hoping that would speak to your need. And here's what I need you to know, that it's inside of this word. God is waiting on you to dive in, and he's waiting to touch your problem with his words right now. So God, I just pray, I pray that it would be said of Bethlehem, Lord, that, that your word, your word is proclaimed above everything else. That, Lord, we may not have these things or that things, or we may not be part of the latest this or the latest that, or we may not have this many people, or we, we may not be a part of this or that, but, Lord, what we do have is you. We have your word, and that's what's changing. That's what's changing people that are coming through these doors. That's what's causing us to seek after you. So today, let today be a moment and a time where we truly see exactly of where we're separated from you, God, and let us make things right in this moment. So I just, I just pray all of this as we're going to be singing. I, I surrender all. And, Lord, just don't let those be words that come across our, our lips because we know them. Lord, let those be words that we truly mean here today. If you need special prayer, please, there are people all across this room that would love to pray for you. Please, if you need someone to come along with you, grab a hold of them, slip up your hand. We'll send somebody to you. Hang out after the service, what, whatever it needs. Just don't leave this place the same way that you walked in this morning. We lift all this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, please respond.